few of you. Um, but it is good to see those I can see. Um, so, yes, um, great worship. And uh, also, I'd just like to thank Mal for the sound that she brought, because uh, that really fits in with some of the things I'm bringing this morning. But when I was sort of uh, praying about what to speak about this morning, it was the world around me that really influenced me. We're in that we're in we're in that couple of week period of the year that I really love, where the world turns beautiful, particularly if you live in the countryside where there's lots of trees and you see the autumn colours, the leaves start to change colour, and you just get this flood of colour right across. And so that got me thinking because to be honest, I, I kind of know, well. The, the, the leaves fall in autumn because we're heading to winter and so it's so that the trees can survive over winter. But never really understood why or looked into it. So I thought, you know, I'd start with a um, bit of a science lesson around uh, why the leaves change colour and fall in autumn. And the leaf colour comes from pig pigments. Um, and it's the pigments are just natural substances that the leaves use to help them get food. And we basically have three different pigments. We have the green, the yellow, and then the reds and pinks. I'm not going to give you the uh, fancy names because uh, A, you probably won't remember them, and B, I can't pronounce them. So we'll just settle for these three basic pigment colours. And if you look at each year, the leaves can be very different colours. And this year, the colours aren't quite as vivid as they have been in the pattern in some years. And a lot of that is about the weather conditions. So if you've got very cold nights and low temperatures, the green fades to yellow. But if the temperatures stay above freezing, the green turns to red. And when the weather's very dry, the redder the leaves become. And if you get a lot of really bright sunny days, that supports the dry weather. And that's when you get the real red colors sweeping across. And then what we get is that the leaves start to drop off and they start to fall. And there's basically a layer of cells that's formed between the stem of the branch and the, the actual leaf stalk. And as the hormones within the tree start to change in autumn, the leaves start to become less securely attached to the tree. And so what happens is that if you get strong winds, which we've had over the past couple of days, you get suddenly a lot of leaves swept away from the trees and our garden is now just a blanket of leaves from the trees around us. And if it's not particularly windy, then the leaves drop off just much more slowly. And all that is part of the seasons. And I'm pretty sure that each one of us have got our own favourite season. So I suppose the question for you now is, which is your favourite season? Is it spring, where you've got all that new life coming? You've got the flowers springing up. You've got those really cute lambs that bound through the fields. Or actually, does the changeable weather, the constant showers get you down a bit and you're just saying, will summer please hurry up? Or is it the summer with that gorgeous sunshine, the long days, the light evenings? Or is some of the time when you like it in theory, but in reality it's too hot for you, you can't cope because of that sticky sweatiness? Is it the autumn? with the beautiful colours as the leaves change? Or actually the shorter nights, days, the dark nights as the clocks change, does that get you down? Is it winter where you get 
those crisp days where the cl sky clears and you've got the blue sky and the sun shining on the snow covered peaks? Or is just winter something that you struggle through and praying for the lighter nights to come? You see, there is a time for everything and there's a season for every activity under the heavens. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, and I know some of you will, will have immediately recognised that. And, but I'm going to read the first 11 verses of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Ecclesiastes is such an unusual book. It's not one that F often gets preached out of. And probably when it does get preached out of, it is this passage that I'm now gone to. And generally, it's not particularly well understood because it tends to be just one of those books. Well, it's there and, you know, it's obviously part of God's inspired word, but it's just there. And it is categorised as one of the books of wisdom. We don't know for definite who wrote it, but we do know some things. We know the author was a king in Jerusalem. We know they were a son of David. We know they were exceedingly wise and that they had many pleasures of the world, but nothing satisfied. Now, all of this fits with what we know of Solomon. And typically, that's who we think the author is. But we can't be conclusively sure. We can't be 100% sure. And, you know, as I've said, you know, this passage is probably the most quoted bit of the book. And it goes through all these opposites. And some of it is very poignant. You know, there's that whole bit, there's, this is verse five, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. We're at the moment in a time to refrain from physical embracing people. But if we look at this passage, what is the author really trying to say? And there are two key things that he's saying. He's saying, first of all, we live in a world of changes. And we've certainly had a change this year. You know, the year, last year ended and this year started when we were being made aware of a virus in some random city that we'd probably never heard of at the other side of the world in China the, where there was, you know, a lockdown going on that suddenly spread to this worldwide pan pandemic that has changed all of our lives. I mean, I think lockdown's probably been an unprecedented experience that's gone far beyond anything we could have ever imagined. So, you know, if we think about the changes that have gone on so far this year, you know, in February, I went to work on the train to offices. I went shopping, 
had meals out with friends, no matter where they lived. I went to church in Kirby Kendall School. I don't know whether you can remember that far back to the school. Uh, and then March hit and we had lockdown. Uh, we were stuck at home, not allowed to see anyone outside of my immediate family. I was out in March, I was working in my caravan and church temporarily stopped while we tried to work out what we could do. April, Zoom. I mean, what more can I say about April other than Zoom? I mean, we did have beautiful weather and I did more walking around Cark than I normally do and I've ever done. In May, we had more lockdown. Uh, I was now working in my newly built summer house where I, I am uh, this, this morning. I had my pre-booked two week summer holiday from work. So the week before lockdown, Sue and I picked up this caravan that we just bought for our May holiday to go touring in. Uh, instead, we had two weeks holiday, sat at home gardening. Thankfully, the weather was good. June, lockdown eased, could finally see friends. I think June was the first time I went to a supermarket from, since lockdown started, because in my family, I was the only one stuck at home. Beth was working in a supermarket. Sue was a domiciliary care worker, so going out, and Kate was working in the food bank. So there was no need for me to go out to the supermarket, so I didn't even do that. We then fast forward to October, and what a change October's been. We finally met physically and over Zoom, the tier systems introduced, and then next week, November, back to lockdown. This has been an unusual year. But do you know what? Change happens constantly. So if I think about my life, so by the time I was 13 months old, I'd lived in six houses in three different countries on two continents. Growing up, I went to school like most people do. I left school like most people do, and I started work. I then got married. That's a change when you get married. Then had children, and that's a bigger change, having children. And then your children start to grow. First day at school, when they look all cute in the school uniform. And then I remember, I think it was Beth, coming home from school one day. It could have been Kate, it was one, one of my children. Um, came home from school, primary school, and asked for a mobile phone. So Sue said, no, you can't. To which the question that came back was, well, how old were you when you got your first mobile? Sue went, 33, one nil. And then your children, Beth and Kate went to big school. That's a step. Then the first day at uni, that really is a milestone. But within all that, I discovered the true meaning of fear. And that is when your children start to learn to drive and you get in that passenger seat with your, your baby driving you. And then I've also had the experience of a child living abroad. And in fact, I've got a child abroad now. Well, that's about changing me and the changes I've been through in my life. What about if we look at changes in the Bible? Think about the disciples. So Peter, for example. Peter, fisherman, getting on with his life. He had his trade. His trade was he went out, he sailed in his boat, he caught fish, brought them in, sold the fish. He then met Jesus. And his world turned upside down. I mean, I'm, I, I can, with 100% certainty, I can guarantee that Peter had no clue what was ahead of him that day he first met Jesus. I'm quite sure that he, there was something about Jesus that 
with a spark something in him that he saw something because otherwise he wouldn't have just given up his livelihood and left everything behind to become Jesus' disciple. And then things were going really well. And his world was ripped apart when Jesus was killed. Totally lost. What do I do now? But Jesus then came back to life. And then came the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And from there, things really changed in Peter's life. As he became an apostle, as he planted churches, as he, as he just went out, Peter's life transformed. Another person in the Bible whose life was transformed was Paul. Think about Paul, a Pharisee, a Pharisee of Pharisees a persecutor of Christians. He went to everything he could do, no ex nothing he would not do to hunt down Christians, lock them up and quite happily kill them until he met God on the road to Damascus. Total change in his life. As he travelled round that whole area, preaching the resurrection of Jesus, bringing the good news as to who Jesus was. But it was ups and downs for Peter, sorry, for Paul, shipwrecked, bitten by a snake, made prisoner the changes he experienced in his life. But, do you know, the other thing that this passage tells us is that every change is determined by a supreme power. That's God. And, you know, that psalm that you read, Mal, during worship, just summed this up perfectly. We have a supreme God who is in control. But as we go through life, you know, I've talked about all the changes that I've been through, the changes we've all been through this year. The changes that, you know, Peter and Paul went through in their lives. But as we go through life, we make choices all of the time. Some of the choices are really small choices. Where shall I fill up my car with fuel? What supermarket shall I shop at? And you know, those choices, they have a bit of an impact. If you fill up your car with fuel at the BP garage, you'll pay more per litre than you will if you go to Asda's and fill up with, with petrol at Asda's. If you go to Aldi to shop, you will spend less money than if you go to uh, Marks and Spencers to shop. But the reality is, as long as you can afford to shop at Marks and Spencers, it doesn't really matter which supermarket you choose to go and shop at. We make choices about what time we get up each morning. Some of those choices might be influenced by the need to get up for work. But if we've got to get to be out of the house for 8 a.m., say, you can either go, so what's the latest I can possibly get out of bed so I'm out of the house for 8? Or you can choose to get up nice and early in plenty of time, have a cup of coffee, then have your breakfast, read the paper, and then go out. We all make those choices. We choose what to have for breakfast, where we go on holiday, which college or university we go to. But the reality is these choices are influenced by other factors. So when it came for an example of this, when it came for Beth to go to high school or secondary school, Beth chose which school she went to. Out of the two schools that Sue and I let her choose between, 
the selection of schools she met and the selection of schools that we made was based on where we live. So we looked, Sue and I looked at the schools that we, the girl Beth could get to and from easily and that were good schools, got good results. We made that, we came up with a, a short list and then we said to Beth, okay, these are the schools that you can go to. Which one do you want to go to? For many people, where they work is influenced by where they live. And then it can be vice versa, that where you live can be influenced by where you work. So in my early career, I spent 10 years as a prison officer in the prison service. And that meant that sometimes you were moved to another prison. Now, I would never was. But if you were moved to another prison, your job moved to another area, that influenced where you then lived. So let's take a moment, think about what are your likes and dislikes? What are your interests? Your taste in fashion, music, sport? How did you develop those? You were almost certainly influenced by someone. Could have been parents, siblings, family members, friends, partner, depending on your age, the internet. How about God? Where does God fit into all this? Where does God fit into the life we live? How much influence does he have in your life? I mean, the answer is, he has a huge influence in your life, whether we act, you actually realise it or not. You know, Psalm 139 talks about, it says, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Uh, my frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. So before we were even born, God knew everything that was going to happen to us and the life we live. But within that, God then guides us. So John 16, 13 tells us how when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So God guides us as well. So, you know, sometimes we do make choices. We make choices about what job we're going to have. But God guides us. And sometimes God will give us a choice. I remember when, because uh, I used to live in Rochdale, for those of you who don't know, um, and we, I had an opportunity to have a job in Cumbria and to then move up to Cumbria. And I had to make a choice. Did I stay in Rochdale? And I was, you know, uh, a central member of the church. I was busy in the church, did a lot of things and real, real settled in the church and God was using me in Rochdale, or did I move up to Cumbria? And it took me a long while to hear that in that particular instance, God gave me a choice to stay in Rochdale or to move up to Cumbria. And I had a, Sue and I had a word spoken over us that God said, this one, the choice is yours. If you stay here, I will use you. If you move to Cumbria, I will use you. And we made the choice to move to Cumbria. Sometimes God directs us much more specifically. So there are other people in other situations that, that Sue and I were in, where actually God might have said, Dave and Sue, you need to stay in Rochdale. Or, no, I am sending you to Cumbria. God guides us. 
And God brings the work that he does in us to completion. There are several other verses we can talk about where God knows what's going to happen to us and God is in control. Romans 8 talks about, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. This is God. He knows everything that's coming. He knows what's going through us, going, what we are going through. But equally, in 1 Corinthians, we read this verse. This is chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. With the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So we have a God who is in control, that sovereign God. We have a God who, because he's sovereign, knows everything that has, has ever happened to us before it happened. And he knows everything that's going to happen for each one of us. And he's in control. And he is in control of what happens to us. Doesn't mean we all go through a nice, easy life. Because we will go through temptation. We will go through difficulties. But God will always give us that ability to get through what he has given us to get through. So the sovereignty of God affects how we make decisions. God guides us. He guides us through scripture. He guides us through uh, other people speaking into our lives. He guides us by influencing the things that go on around us. But we are still left with choices and decisions to make on a daily basis. And some of them are very small. Some of them can be major changes. Do I apply for a certain job or not? But because we know that God's in control, and because we know that God is sovereign, that means that when we come to making decisions, we can just make the decisions. We should give them over to God and we should ask God's advice and we should seek what God wants. But if we're not clear, or we're not certain, we shouldn't start being worried and go, oh, no, I can't. What, what if I make the wrong decision? What if this decision takes me out of God's will? We live under grace. We live with a forgiving God who is in control, who is supreme. If you ever make a wrong decision, do you know what? It doesn't matter. Because if it was the wrong decision, God will sort it out. God will set us back on that right path, the path that he wants us to be on. We can trust in God's faithfulness, his love, his grace, and his ability to keep us on that right course. So we can and should make mistakes. Because even though God is in sovereign control, it doesn't mean either that we should sit idly by and allow life to happen. It means that we should press into life with our focus on God and trusting that our father sees the larger picture and is faithfully working everything for his glory. Because that is why we're here. We're here for his glory. And the ultimate message from this Bible is that God is sovereign. 
you know, the, sorry, from the passage, verse 11 says this, he, that's God, has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. He has set eternity in your heart. You have God in you. Knowing that God's sovereign and therefore in control is something that we can draw strength on as we live in a changing world. And as we live in these days that we're going through right now, the one thing that we can be certain of is that God is our constant. He is our rock. He is our anchor. And it doesn't matter what happens, he will always be there. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He doesn't change. And we can quote scripture on, on scripture upon scripture about that. James talks about every good gift and perfect gift is from above. Numbers tells us that God is not man that he should lie. And asks us, if God says something, will he not do it? If God's spoken something, will he not fulfill it? God is constant. He doesn't change. Everything around us changes. We go through seasons. Some of the seasons we feel in control of. And in the Western world, it's too easy to feel in control of our lives, to feel that everything's sorted and, oh, we know what's going to happen because we have this life and we know what will happen. And then a pandemic hits and turns everything upside down. And yet within that, we have a sovereign God who we worship who has planted eternity in our hearts. And I just want to close with this one verse. It's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour, and glory forever and ever. Amen. Great, thanks very much.